We are kicking off a series for the month of May, all honoring moms coming from different spaces because, you know, May is Mother's Day. And I think that there are some pretty fierce women who also carry the title of mother that I want you to hear from. So this is for my mamas. Have you ever just felt like there are so many balls up in the air and so many titles that you carry and you're wondering if the toothpaste in the bathroom is going to get cleaned and how somebody is going to get to a certain event that they might have and how you're going to manage all of that while still carrying on your career or responsibilities and having your own self-identity, let alone maybe even taking a shower. Yes, sometimes it's the little things that are really hard for us to remember to do as moms because we're responsible for other people's lives. I remember when Jim would come home when I was on maternity leave and he was like, how was your day? What did you guys do today? And I was like, I don't know, I kept a kid alive. Isn't that enough? And of course my loving husband, he got all of my sarcasm and jokes and was super supportive. Now, that being said, I can't wait for you to hear the story today from my friend, Kimmy Wilson. She is a licensed doula and the CEO and founder of Love Your Journey Doula Services. She has a passion for helping mamas. As a military spouse and someone who actively served that community with so much heart and desire, she is also a mother of a special needs son who she loves and cares for and is deeply involved in that community. She has a 19-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 6-year-old. She is a mom of many different facets and experiences, much like all of us, so I hope that no matter where you are on your motherhood journey, you can take something from Kimmy and hear truly how you can help start to care for yourself. Because at the end of the day, mamas, if we don't care for ourselves, we're going to be left empty when we aren't able to care for anyone anymore. So it's important that you begin to care for you. So tune in to Kimmy's wonderful words and encouraging spirit. Kimmy, thank you so much for joining us on the Thrive Forward podcast. I am beyond excited to have you because you and I have such great conversations and I think you are going to provide the utmost value to our audience today about your story and your journey. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm blessed to be here. Let's let's share a little bit with our audience about who you are uh, and and why your story is so important. Um, to them to learn like who are you where what's your what's your story where are you coming from where are the experiences of being a mother and being all of the titles that you carry which are not just one or two but many (laughs) thank you so I am a my husband was active duty military he just recently retired so we are currently stationed in Fort Hood, Texas. Yep. The one that was in the news, that's where we are, (laughs) but we are a little bit of everywhere. Grew up in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, spent the majority of my time in Tucson, Arizona, which is where I met my husband. Um, I have three beautiful children, 19, just turned nine and six. Um, I am a doula, both in postpartum and labor, um, and the developer of the self-care pamper box, Love Your Journey. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. <laughs> I And then that's just like, that's like the short resume version. Let's right, talk right. about your journey. And I want you to be raw and real with our audience because that is like, right, let's go. that is you, that is who you are. And that is why I love you so much because you bring that raw and real feeling that is so necessary in these conversations, especially around how women come together, but especially how mothers come together. And I would love to hear for you how that journey was for you in becoming a mom. Um, being a mom of multiple children at different age ranges, um, being a military spouse, still serving others, being a black mother of young boys, uh, especially given all of the current circumstances in our country that are just now awakening to some, but have been a journey for you your entire life. 
Well, I guess let's start with, um, I never thought I was going to be a mother. <laughs> you know, I come from um, some family trauma. So I had always said, I, I, like, uh, parenting was not going to be my jam, right? Like, that was going to be for other people. And, um, you know, I got pregnant with my oldest at about 19 years old. And so I was like, here, here we go. <laughs> like, I guess, I, I guess I'm doing it. <laughs> right. So that's kind of how uh, my motherhood journey got started. Um, like pregnancy and all of that was not very smooth. However, I was, you know, a first time mom, I didn't know any different. Right. So roll in to, um, Almost 10 years later, um, I really, I was currently married to my second husband and um, I really wanted another child and we were having difficulty. And so um, at the time I was an event planner. And so I planned tons of events. And if you can imagine, one of those events is a baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> and so I really wanted a little girl. So I just wanted a child, but I really wanted a little girl. I'm a super girly girl. And so I just wanted to be able to you know, dress her and do all the little frilly things and braid the hair and you know, my little life size Barbie. And so I, uh, we started looking to foster to adopt. And so we went through that process for a year and, um, through that process, which for anyone who's doing that, like kudos to you, it is amazing work. It is hard work. I see you through that. And it takes a really special type of person and couple to be able to do that work. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of our, our journey, um, our marriage was just over. <laughs> so it ended. Um, and then I met my current husband now, Ted. Um, and not very long after that, I got pregnant and we had our beautiful baby girl. And um, you would think like, oh, you've, I've prayed for this child for 10 years. It's going to be like you, you, you know, fairy tale it, right? Like it's going to yep. be so amazing. And and uh, nope, stop the press. It was not, it was not amazing. The pregnancy was horrific. Mm -hmm. um, I had total TPN care, um, which I had like a little uh, for all the nurses, but people who are not uh, medical professionals, it was a IV that went right here in my arm and went into my, my uh, arteries in my heart and fed me food from about eight weeks until 38 weeks. And I was on bed rest the whole entire time. I had hyperemesis, um, which is a condition like Kate Middleton um, and other celebrities. So it's kind of became well known after that, but you, it's like morning sickness on crack. <laughs> like that's the best Gosh. way to explain it. Like you just don't throw up in the morning. You throw up every single meal and all day long. And so it became very um, taxing on my body because I was losing more weight than I was yeah. gaining, which you can imagine in a pregnancy where you're supposed to be building, you know, growing this tiny little human that can become very dangerous since I was hospitalized a lot um, and almost died. I was hospitalized for about a, m a month and then had a lot of emergency visits that um, left me actually having a near-death experience with um, my daughter and my son. So um, just really a hard, hard journey. Um, let me rewind just a little bit. So I had hyperemesis with my daughter and then um, I was like, you know, you forget when you're pregnant, if you have any like... Um, difficulties of how hard it is because you know that got, you've got that little squish in your hand you know so you're yeah. like forget and um then I told my husband I, was like, I think I, I we should have another kid and he looked at me like you are crazy I was like yeah let's do it and the doctor said you know you have a 50 percent chance of getting that again and I was like I'm a gambler let's roll the dice turns out <laughs> I had the condition again so um I got to experience that two times. Um, and in my, you know, having those pregnancies, we got to the end of that with our last one who's six and, uh, 
a lot of medical issues that he had. He was born and considered medically fragile. And up until 18 months of his life, we did a lot of just caring for him, making sure that he was alive. The doctors told us he wouldn't make it till his first birthday. And so um, after we got to the end of that 18 months, he was diagnosed with autism. So my parenting journey has um, really started in pregnancy and then continued on with care for my special needs kiddo and navigating that world um, in the middle of a military transition. You know, we're moving from place to place and my husband uh, picked a job where he would be like, it's called an MOS for people who are active duty or in the military. And that's the kind of the code of your job. And the job that he picked required him to be home one year and then deployed the next. Mm. And so he was just gone um, a lot. He did six years and was gone for pretty much four of those. So I was a single parent, even though he's single parent, but married, <laughs> yeah. doing this life uh, pretty much by myself while navigating the special needs world um, with very limited resources. And so that kind of parenting journey while also assisting other military families and navigating their lives and you know, new parents and new soldiers coming in, that really brought me along my journey to the work that I, that I currently do because um, I really didn't feel like I had a lot of options in my pregnancy. And so I wanted to be the change for other women. And so I really had a heart to do this, you know, this doula thing and start, and that's how Love Your Journey became, became a thing. I really became my heart stake in pregnancy and parenting. And I thought, how can I make a difference in other people's lives and be a tool to help them in education and empowerment. And so that's a little bit about my parenting journey. Oh my goodness. I mean, to abbreviate it just to that small synopsis that you shared, I can't even imagine the roller coaster ride that it was. I mean, you and I were joking before this that, yeah, life is just linear, which is, which is <laughs> <Yeah>. a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. So if you're trying to subscribe to a linear life, it's just not going to happen for you. And setting I, yourself up for some failure on that. <laughs> right. And, and some and, heartache. And life transitions happen and they happen. I mean, you're sharing with us more life transitions that happen on top of each other, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just mm -hmm. back to back, um, yeah. pregnancy. It wasn't just birth. It was now dealing with a special needs child on your own while your husband's deployed, while helping other families. Like women are fierce creatures and, and being able to birth a child. I used to joke um, when I was, in corporate and I was pregnant with both of my daughters, somebody would ask me, what have you done today? I was like, I don't know. I've grown limbs. What have you done? <laughs> and they, Which is they, true. It's so true, right? We, we downplay it so much, but we really are amazingly fierce human beings as women and what our bodies are capable of doing. It, it's amazing. Like it literally is mind blowing. So I, that's what I tell my mamas. Like, they're like, I'm just really tired. I'm like, but you're, you're creating a whole person. Like that's a full-time job. So give yourself credit for doing that. Right. And we don't do that enough. Well, and I think we, we feel the expectation to not right. To just suck it up. And, yeah, and keep moving <laughs> and keep moving and going because we live in a society that's designed frankly, for men, um, that women have to just suck it up and keep going. But how do we create community? I think that that's one of the things that you're so good at and you're so Thank genuine you. in the spirit that you create and the spaces that you create for women to feel all of the feelings because we, we don't allow ourselves to do that, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you and I have talked about the, the exteriors that we both put up too as women and, and starting to take some of that down as defense mechanisms from life's traumas that we've dealt with. How have you seen that transformation affect you throughout your motherhood, being able to like tear down some of those barriers while building up some that are necessary for you? Uh, I'm going to totally give the credit to my children because uh, you can only hold a mask with your kids for so long, right? Like when they say like kids 
give you the truth. Like it is like the raw skinny mini down to it, right? Like they have zero filter and thank God for that. Because if you are trying to keep it all together and do all the things or even remotely being fake, your kids will call bullshit on that in a heart in a hot minute. Right. So I really do have to say that like uh, a lot of that has to go with my children holding a mirror back to me and um, being like, okay, I got to get, <laughs> I got to get real. And my daughter is like wicked smart. So I can like try to poo poo an answer for her and she'll be like, mom like I want the real answer like we just had to have a conversation about the birds and bees thank you National Geographic um, (laughs) for that and she was like I want to know how babies are born we were like oh well you know parents get together and she was like no I want to know actually how it works and I was like okay like where's your dad (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like I do this work but like when you're when your kids hit you with stuff sometimes you're like it, it takes you a moment so like my husband and me sat down and had a conversation with her but really I think that's for me anyways um they keep me honest authentic accountable present um so that's I mean that's really how my parenting with them has worked. You know, I went in with all those preconceived notions of what I thought a mother was going to be and what that was going to look like. Um, and uh, you learn real quick that they change, they change the game on you. And you they have to do, constantly, and they don't come with instructions. No, you have to constantly be reevaluating and upping your game and reassessing and then trying it and going back to the drawing board. Like it's a never ending process. So, yeah. I am so curious to hear from you too. You you mentioned this like element of being honest with our kids. And I think, um, you know, you and I are around the same age. So we grew up in maybe a little bit of a different space where our parents, at least my mom, like yeah. when I got my period, it was like, there's some stuff under a counter over there. Yeah. Take care of it. We didn't even have a conversation. So at least you got the, it's under the counter. We didn't, I didn't get that. <laughs> We didn't have a conversation about the birds and the bees. Like (laughs) there was, there was none of this type of conversation. It was just like, you'll figure it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like our generation of mothers is, is somewhat in this rock, rock and a hard place aspect of like, we were raised in this element of children are to be seen, not heard. To a place where like, we actually have kids who can't be heard. How do mm-hmm. we help them discover their voice so that they mm-hmm. can be heard? Mm-hmm. And we're stuck in that space of like telling people like, no, this is actually how you healthy like process as a parent. Like what you taught us was maybe not the most healthy way of parenting. Right, right, right. But we're trying to flip that. So it's this like change of generational um breaking trauma that's passed down, right. That we don't necessarily always define as trauma, but it's that passing down. And you had mentioned, you know, not wanting to be a mom because I was the same way. I I didn't know that I wanted to be a mom. I I wouldn't change it for the world. Right, right, right. None of us who are on the experience would, wouldn't change it. But I don't think when you're, I mean, when I was when I was like 16, 17, 18, like I wasn't thinking about having like that just when I envisioned my life, like that was not a part of the dream. Right. Like, I mean, for some people it is like my daughter, she tells me all the time, she can't wait to be a mother. I take that as like, I'm doing a better job than my mother and her mother, because that is in her wheelhouse of a dream that she, because she thinks I'm a good teacher, she doesn't really know. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she doesn't hard. realize I'm faking it. No, I'm kidding. I'm giving myself a hard time. But um, she sees a better model, and therefore she wants to be what she sees. Right. So you're you're right. Like when you don't have that, you don't necessarily grow up or have those desires to be that way. Right. Like so. Yeah, I I can totally relate with that. And I get what you're saying about like, you know, your parents um, taught you or like, well, you know, sh- kids are quiet. They're 
you're in check, you're in line, which most people our age have perfectionism <laughs> and all of those things, right? From, you know, and being people pleasers, it's very common, uh, a personalities and in our age bracket. Um, and I think a lot of that has that we could totally go in a nature versus nurture conversation there too. So, so let's go there. Uh, I know <laughs> you, you could. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how, you were raised and how that either affects your parenting or changes your parenting. For me, it was definitely the catalyst of like, here was a model that I was shown and I want to make sure that I have a better model. That doesn't mean that there aren't things that like happened in my childhood that I of course um, continue on as, as far as certain traditions and things, but it definitely did give me a drawing map um, and where to like jump off from and to make better. Yeah. It was an element of reflecting back and saying like, I don't want to be in that situation. And I tell my mom Mm -hmm. all the time, like her relationship and I, our relationship has definitely evolved. Mm -hmm. And my mom didn't have a great example of what a mother was. And so it was like her mom passed down this to her, to me. And then I was like, okay, now, now we're going to stop. Cause I have daughters and I'm not passing that mm-hmm, a lot to mm-hmm, them. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, and we need to I transition that. that. We, t- we talked, you, you mentioned this perfectionism aspect of things. Mm-hmm. I, I was recently told by someone that their children really appreciated when they were younger, that they were, that they admired themselves as perfect to their children, that they didn't show the bad stuff that was happening in life and that instead everything looked shiny and perfect. And that when we show our kids emotion and the hard stuff, they actually don't appreciate it. I would disagree with that. Tell me more about that. I would disagree because, I mean, for I, and I'm, I'm only speaking from my perspective. Um, I have done that, right? So I can speak really from both sides. Like I have led that, (laughs) led that, ooh, everything looks great. Ooh, something shiny on the outside, right? There's the mask. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, And I realized it only, I guess I really want to say more intensely when COVID happened, because then you're, you're, you're with everyone 24, seven and 24, seven, right? And I noticed um, for some, a big, big, big advocate of therapy. I go to therapy. I think it's amazing. It's like getting your car tuned up and yes. having an oil change. And so, um, while I was in therapy and working on some of my own character flaws, I was noticing that my daughter was mimicking some of those things mm-hmm. of people pleasing and being really hard on herself. And I realized that it was the mask wearing that I was modeling and also some of the verbiage that I was using to her without realizing that it was, it was, it was carrying a weight on her. And so I really quickly had to start finding new phrases to say to her that would lessen her like need to feel like she had to do something to make me feel like she was doing a good job or making me feel like she was, um, that thing was done perfectly. Right. So I think that when I allowed her to see me not having it all together, it gave her the permission to also release herself. Mm -hmm. And when she started to release that, we started to realize, because honestly, halfway through COVID, she's like, I'm fine. Like, everything's fine. I'm doing great. And I was like, okay, well, mom's not fine. Like, I miss my friends. This sucks. Like, I had, and the second we did that, like, literally in a conversation, she was like, I'm great. And then she look and she was like, and like, I was like, and there it is. Like, so I would challenge anyone who is setting in that, um, to try it, try the other shoe. 
you know, take off the mask, get authentic with your children and see what happens. Because sometimes they're putting on their mask because they think that's what you need Mm -hmm. to see. And so that's really what we learned. And so I can say from the other side of it that I think showing her and my son just, you know, that we, you know, I show them when I make mistakes. I, uh, you know, yesterday I was recording a, a TikTok, <laughs> which is still new. And, um, you know, I still have that perfectionism brain, right? And so I'm recording it and recording it. And, you know, I'm just recording it, not thinking anything. And she's over there watching me and she's being, she wants to be such a little assistant. You know, she's pushing the play button and she goes, mom, I can tell that your anxiety, you're, it's getting to you. You're getting frustrated and, and it's going to be okay, mom. She was literally doula me in that moment. Like <laughs> she's like, mom, maybe you should just take like a five minute break and just let's just breathe. And then we'll go again. And I was like, you know, you know what? Like, like, and, but me showing that to her, like having that frustration and having that moment and her seeing that it also helped me to realize like, one, she's right. And <laughs> two, I need to be, I need to take a break. And then I was able to show her like, nope, you know what? We're going to pick one of these and we're just going to, we're just going to upload it. Like it doesn't need to be perfect. It's okay. And she, she got the biggest smile on her face. And so I think it's important to show that and have them have examples of that. Um, where you're failing and when you're sad. I mean, there's also a balance, right? Like your your um, children are not your friends, right? So you have to make sure that you still have the healthy boundaries. Like there are still parental guidelines that need to be set, but um, it's still a relationship, but it, it does need to have definitely healthy boundaries in that. But yeah, I say I would challenge people to who have that type of thinking to try it the other way and see how your children respond. Well, and I think we teach our kids how to manage mental health in an era where we have a mental health crisis, like Mm -hmm. your daughter being able to recognize for you, but also for herself when she might be in those situations of overwhelm or anxiety or different. And that's life. That's life. Right. Like we're going to experience those those things. And when life hits us or life transitions, our mental capacity is something that's so important to be able to get us through any of those life transitions, whether it be something as simple as recording a TikTok video, how is that (laughs) helping her prepare her own mind? I, I just think that those tools and resources are so much more important sometimes for our children to learn than Mm -hmm. even some of the things that we teach them academically. Right. Like you're teaching them coping skills that are going to last them their whole lives. <laughs> right. Correct. So, and they, the only way they learn those is by putting them into action. You have to give them the opportunities to work out those skills. Yeah. I could not agree more. And I think that that's kind of how I've taken that element of, of parenting as well. I remember never seeing my mother cry. Mm-hmm. Same, same. And she went through a lot of it. And for her to mm-hmm. never cry, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So much truth in that. Yep. How are we properly, and, you know, and then it's like, okay, then I have to keep up this facade. The facade, yeah. That everything's okay. And mm-hmm. I don't think she meant to teach me that. Right, right. That was what she was also taught. Mm-hmm. And so it passed on to another generation. How do you think that... Um, as we, we talk about raising children and especially a special needs child, the challenges that arise from that. But I want you to also talk about the elephant that might be in the room. But for those of you that cannot see, Kimmy is a beautiful black queen. So can you talk oh, about how you. it is raising young black children in America right now too? Um, I will first take the both of... Um, raising my children are mixed. My husband is white. And so, um, this sounds yuck to even say, but here we go. My children don't necessarily look like they're black, like they're, 
yucky, but people would say like, sometimes they're like, oh, they just got a nice tan. They don't realize when they're with their dad, they just think they've been out in the sun, you know, but then when they're with me, I also get, are you the nanny? So it's like they kind of fall. <laughs> I don't know where they fall, but yeah. Anyways, um, I will talk about how like having, having that and raising boys as a black woman, you're always teaching them to be respectful and to keep your hands out of your pocket. If you're stopped by the police, what they, what do they need to say? And, and for me, it's been a challenge because my 19 year old is, um, does not like authority very well. So it's a constant conversation. And so in this time, uh, my mommy antennas of worry have been really high. Um, because watching the news and seeing everything, I'm very concerned about what would happen if he just for a split second would um, lose his temper and what, how that might be perceived by the people around him. Um, and for my little one who's six, uh, that weighs on me a lot you know he for a, the first up until two he was um he was coded as being nonverbal, and they told us he wasn't going to be able to talk until he was six and I just don't I don't I, I tell anyone who has any special needs children to first of all you are the expert in your child mm -hmm. you carried them you birthed them, even though a doctor has credentials. This is not knocking anyone who has medical credentials. I get it. I understand. Got some of my own. But you are the expert in your child. Nobody knows them better than you. And so um, when I was, when, if you are a, are a special needs parent and they're telling you that your child can't do X, Y, Z, I challenge you to challenge them um, because we did that. And Liam has a full vocabulary and has been talking nonstop since he was four years old. Um, but for me, he still misses a lot of social cues. Um, and so though that, um, because he's autistic, so that, coupled with being a, you know, biracial in this time, it's like, what if somebody misconstrues something that he is genuinely trying to say and takes it as something else? So I have a, a, a more, I feel like a more intense fear, which, you know, spe special needs children or parents already deal with, you know, inappropriate touching that your kids might do or saying things without filter that are feel really inappropriate to other people. And it, it's not that it isn't, but it's just like you'd live with that every day. So right. it's your norm. But like, you know, we are in the store and he's like, you stink. Well, the person did stink, but like, we know we don't tell them that they stink, but he's just literally communicating what he is experiencing so yeah it's really difficult I feel like I'm on both ends of the spectrum right like my son is 19 and I have been teaching him this this whole 19 years of his life and um thankfully bless he really didn't have to experience any um racism like I did as a child up until he was 16 years old that was his first time ever experiencing that and he was like he he his brain couldn't even fathom what that was but parenting him in that time looks really different than parenting my six-year-old right now like even though I knew there were things that I had to tell him and I had a little bit of fear of what that might happen to him if he got into a situation with a police officer that might not be on the up and up or um, profiling him because of his skin tone, um, it looks very different than now, right? Like with all of the things that are happening, you can't go for a run. You, you're, you're not even safe in your house. Like that to me is just, um, I, I, pro I can process, but I can't process. Like, it's just like, I'm waiting for someone to be like, 
like, oh, oh, that was a dream. Like, it's not even a pinch me. Like, I like this. It's not a dream. Like, this is life. This is real life. These are things that we're really experiencing. And, and so it is different. It's, um, it's stressful. It's trying to communicate and navigate, telling him what he needs to do. And, in a way that he can understand and that he can actually um, apply. And it's hard. It's, it's hard. And then having a different conversation with my daughter, you know, about safety and she's for nine, she's so woke. Like, you know, like I'm just trying to make pancakes one day and she's like, it's seven 30 in the morning and now and I'm got like, I barely open. And she's like, I want to talk about, um, racism and women's equality. I'm like, it's seven 30, Michaela. Like we just, can we just make that? I just want to make the pancakes right now. Let's get them to the table. And then we can tackle one at a time. Right. So she's very, um, wants to understand the history of it. She wants to understand the why of it. She wants to read all the materials that we can give her and the books and the videos. And so that helps to be able to teach her at least. Um, my nine-year-old is angry. Sorry. You take your time. He is angry and he is struggling with the fact that you know we just filled out was was talking about filling out a college application and and said mom which one do I pick do I do I pick the white box or the or the black box and and so we had have a conversation about that and you know his dad was uh, you know his his uh my ex-husband he's also white and he said oh well you know you check the black box because you get more you get more benefits with that and I said you know like even those comments even though you think that that it might be funny or um that's not helping like that's that's not helping him and it wasn't like what gets him more benefits right he was real in real time having an identity crisis and I watched him go through this process of where um he felt like he had to talk a certain way and dress a certain way and act a certain way and have certain, you know, change his friends. Like it was a real struggle while having this world situation happen and trying to just really hear him in where he was and trying to support him, but realizing that I also don't have all the answers, right? Like coming from my own perspective, being raised mostly in Indiana, all around a white culture and being told that, you know, I myself um, was not accepted or not, not white, like didn't talk white enough and did it fit in the black community because I wasn't black enough or being judged because I had quote unquote, the good hair, which is just fucking crazy. Sorry, but it's just crazy, right? So, um, and I went into my parenting that way. Um, not, I mean, I can say this now, but like I went into that with my 19 year old, not giving him, I think enough tools. Mm. And so seeing him struggle now with some of the questions and I just want to be like, oh, like, that's one of those things where I felt, I fell short as a parent. Like if I would have been more active in um, my own black heritage and culture and shown that more to him, maybe he wouldn't have such a big identity crisis right now in this time. And so, um, you know, that's also, it's the, downside but also the blessing you know like I can do better with my other children and so we do have more conversations now because I'm looking at their older brother and seeing where I fell short in that um I prepared him you know for the things that could happen to him um but did not prepare him in the education of more about 
who he was. And as I've been having these conversations with more of my black and brown friends and my, my siblings, um, they also are having this acknowledgement as well for themselves. Like we didn't do that. And, you know, my sister has seven children is uh, now pregnant with her eighth. So I'm about to be an auntie again. And uh, yeah, you might want to, you might want to talk to her next. She's got a oh, lot of experience. And yeah, she, we are having these discussions about like, we were really taught all these things as a kid and what that looks like and how we can do better in parenting and what we, what our children need because her children are also mixed. And so that they don't have that identity crisis and they feel whole Mm -hmm. um, and not just teaching them how to be safe, which really without realizing it is also teaching them that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Like something about them is not safe to others and that's hard so it's really finding the balance and but still as a mother having that worry for your children and their safety in this time and we are in texas Mm -hmm. and texas is real real um republican and real not happy that um, they're real close to being blue And so it has caused, and we're in a military town, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which has had its own um, troubles. Colleen uh, Fort Hood has had a lot of um, military deaths and and suspicious things happen here. And so um, my mama antenna, my mama bear, zone is very on the defense not only for my children but also you know the my clients children that I work with you know I'm constantly looking scanning you know I'm just in this um protective mechanism space of scan look check assess you know so um and I'm and, and I'm unfortunately having to teach my children that Uh, Because we're having situations here in Texas where going out to a restaurant now, it can be a situation, unfortunately. And I I hear you in the aspect of this battle with empowering your children, right? Empowering them to know what their life possibility is, right? Especially with Liam, right? Your youngest, like, to be able to take that empowerment while also almost carrying this tightrope of teeter totter into educating them on kind of that aspect of the ugly parts of society that again, Mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this, not only as, as mothers have we had to put a mask on, but now we're putting a mask on um, in other capacities Mm -hmm. to, to pretend like something hasn't existed for so many. And, and now we're really peeling back. And I do think COVID had, had a great deal to do with that, being able to pull back some of those elements to see the reality of so many. How do we, how do we move in a direction that allows us, again, you we talk about you being really great at community, using your story and your experience with your family without being the only educator like how do we empower others to come to the table and have these conversations and hear people for truly what they are because you and I have talked about this mothers and women can really change the world but if we constantly don't believe other people's experiences we won't be able to create that change and instead we'll stay stagnant and it will impede the future of our children even more so um, than they already are I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going through that process to myself. One, you're right, sharing your experiences and, and really using your voice and the platform that you're, you're in is c- crucial during this time. So that would be um, my first suggestion for people like, 
everyone, <laughs> like everyone, not just women of color. Um, that's, that's everyone like you all, like whether it's social media, you're, you don't, you don't even have to have a social media platform or a business or any of those things, but you have friends and your friends have girlfriends and they have husbands and they have kids. And so having the tough conversations with the people that you do life with is the number one thing, how we all get the ball rolling in a more positive direction. Um, and for people who don't have a person of color in your life, I want to challenge you to why, why is that? Why don't you? And then go find them and using excuses of I'm in a small town that's not here. Those don't work anymore. Um, because there are you have access to TV, to social, to books. You have materials. The library is still free. You can still check out books. You can look at videos on YouTube, on Instagram, listen to podcasts, like really dig deep in the information, um, the education, the free tools, engage in conversation. Um, I think that is how we change not only as women and bonding together to make a difference, but as a society. I think that's very true. And I think being able to get out, I mean, uncomfortable conversations are necessary and they're oh, not comfortable. Hell yes. <laughs> they're not comfortable for a reason because right, right. we've buried so many things for so long, or we've tried to make things look perfect. And I would, I would say that you can start those conversations and you can also start the conversations with your children. I, right. I think that this is something really important that people think that our children aren't smart enough to have these conversations. Oh, they're smart and watching everything, huh? Everything. 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 And they're sponges and they learn. And there is a reason why people tell you that um, learning a language is easier when you are a younger individual, right? Our kids mm -hmm. don't learn hate. They are taught it. They don't learn prejudice. They are taught it. And I think yes. it's some of those aspects of being able to surround your children with, um, with different cultures, not just, not just other cultures that are different from yours, your own culture. I caution yeah. a lot of white folks, white is not a culture. Right. Right. <laughs> Society has made white a culture, but, right. but you're preach <laughs> for, for us, in, for us in our household. Um, you know, my husband, his family has a huge, um, Polish and Czech side of it. So, so we educate our children around those heritage. My side has Irish, Swedish, Jewish. Um, so we're teaching our kids about Passover and we're teaching our kids about Jewish heritage and, and culture as of right now. And we're talking about and celebrating different foods of our own cultures. And then we're taking them and having the conversations about other cultures, but you can do that through books and dolls and toys and the environments that you surround yourself in Absolutely. what's Absolutely. shown, shown your your kids on TV, what elements are available to them and being cognizant of the characters that they're seeing and what characters are being played out and how are they positively affirming others, right? That's that element of that sub subconscious education that you were just talking about with your children where you're straddling this empowerment and education piece. What are the pieces as, as white mothers that we are surrounding in images of children of color? Are they, you know, what part of the storyline in a book, what part of a storyline in a movie are they playing? How are those images impacting our children and how are we having those conversations around things? Uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm a very I, realist I, parent. So my, my kids, um, we, we live in Minneapolis. They, last summer, they came to protests with me. They were at George Floyd Square. They have real conversations around everything. They ask me questions. We talk about things. And I, I'm very conscious of the cultures that they absorb so that they mm -hmm. understand that we have to show love to everyone, no matter what. And what does that look like and model like? 
Yeah. And I think you hit the the nail on the head, right? Like, my, like my white brothers and sisters, they, it's the uncomfortableness in doing that with their parenting. And I don't think, I mean, for some, I think that it's not because they don't want to, they just don't know the correct way to go about it. And the uncomfortableness keeps them from doing it because they're afraid they're going to do it wrong or maybe offend someone. So they don't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, I'll, I'll use a friend that I had in the past. Um, I, I was, uh, actually coming into her home and her little one had a doll and she was like, Oh, uh, we, we, you know, we got her, um, a, a mixed baby doll. And you know, I, you remember the water babies. Yes, for <laughs> totally sure. totally. for She's sure. like, it was the, it was the only one they had. And I was like, and I look back now and I'm like, you don't like, there was no reason to qualify why you had the doll. Like there was nothing wrong with having the, the, you know, the, the brown water baby, you know, like, um, but it made her really uncomfortable. And I think if we had more of those uncomfortable and leaned into it and white women and men leaned into that, um, we would have more open conversations and maybe, um, we would have less of what we're experiencing right now. And that is my hope is that we continue to have hard conversations. We continue to lean into them. We can continue to download those hard conversations into our children and have them become a regular just flow of conversation where they can ask and feel safe enough to ask. Um, because you're right. Like the kids don't see it. Like, you know, they're, they, they don't know. They're like, oh, you just have, you have brown, you just have darker skin. Like they don't, they, it's very innocent. And so I think it's the time when your parent, when you're a parent and your children are young to, to grab a hold of that innocence and give them all of the love and kindness uh, for the rest of humanity that you can before they start forming their own opinions. <laughs> and it's harder right. to change those, right? once they've already become what they want to become and their friends and they say that's like at five their, right like they really adapt to their personalities at five yeah so early so get to work <laughs> get to so work. early like it is yeah. not too early to start the conversations with your children and um, and be able to do that element of things i think that this is a, a good place to kind of transition into your actual professional career because you you have taken all of these experiences of your life to live a life of as i truly look at it as servant leadership i mean you mm. you mm. truly are um showing up in places for women when they are most vulnerable and for women who have not birthed a child let me just depict physically you are literally quite most vulnerable but emotionally you are as well um yeah. you know i don't care if anybody sees me naked anymore because i've been in a room where people <laughs> see me naked That's right every mother feels after um, they're like whatever yeah legs up legs, and whatever. stirrups all of the things right but yeah just get the baby out <laughs> but now like the baby was inside and now it's out and now it's squishy. And you're like, shit, what do I do with this small child? And you're mm -hmm. taking this raw and vulnerable experience that you have experienced as a mother and still are experiencing. And you transition this into a love and care that is beyond measure for the women that you mm -hmm. serve mm -hmm. and the change that you create within an industry where there are not a lot of women that look like you. And mm -hmm. frankly, as you mm -hmm. and I have talked about, um, there is not a lot of strong support systems for women of color in the birthing element. And we can talk about that in like a whole nother episode. I feel like. <laughs> We sure can. <laughs> That's like a whole nother piece of things is there is this lack of supportive care. And you talked about that as your own experience of not really understanding as a first time mother, we didn't even dig into the elements that could have been related to your own personal experience as a black mother for the first time mm -hmm. too. Yeah. How do you feel like this is your calling and answering in that space to be able to care for women? And why did you find that as a transition in your life? So apparently important to you? Um, well, I've always, I think it's one, just my personality. Like I've always been, um, I'm a PK kid, which is a preacher's daughter. Um, 
or preacher's kid, but uh, we've, you know, I, I say sometimes like my whole family has been um, almost like it's our destiny to, you know, like our calling of my family to be some kind of service. You know, I say, and I joke that our family kind of has only three lanes you get to pick. You either go into the ministry, uh, nursing, or the military, and that's it. Pick your three, uh, one of your three and go. Um, but for me, it's just always been that way. Uh, I started out in the medical field. Um, my, I thought my specialty was going to be hospice. And then I was like, I really like babies. So maybe I'll, I'll go that route. Um, but I did, I landed in hospice and hospice care for some time, um, while doing the event planning, but, uh, it was my children. It was the birth of my children. And and I can look back now in my pregnancy with my oldest, Cedric, and, and realize that, like, I had hyperemesis all three times, but that because I was a new mom and because I was a Black woman, uh, I just was, you know, and, and the, for those that don't know, like, a lot of times Black women um, are not heard their concerns during pregnancy fall on deaf ears and I was definitely one of those and did not even realize it until my third pregnancy <laughs> and I mean I'm 38 <laughs> my son is gonna be seven in June so uh, let that sink in you know um, and that realizing that I mean I was literally in labor with my daughter or no in labor with my or going to be in labor with my son and fired my OB in the hospital and like I remember the staff being like oh my god it was like such a scandal and I was like but she works for me and she's not working for me so she's got to go like I remember just throwing up so much having my head in the trash can and her being annoyed that I was so sick that she had to send me to the hospital. And I was like, this is not gonna like, you know, we've been through this once before. I almost died, excuse me, here we are. And you're annoyed with my presence. Like that doesn't feel like knowing having enough medical work. Like I was like, that's not okay. Like <laughs> we gotta change that, right? And so coming from that, um, I just know, like, I just knew, like, there are, there are women like me and that I can help women who look like me and feel like me and are having the experiences like me. I can help them to make sure that they don't have the same experience and don't feel the same way and don't carry the hardships that I had to carry through all three of my pregnancies. And I can literally not necessarily make their pregnancy um like what physically is happening to their body any better but the part of the emotional part I can make them love that journey wherever they are at and whatever they are in and support them by giving them education and love and enough tools to make them feel like they've got it right like and I think sometimes when people get confused, like what is a doula or, you know, like that one don't know how to uh, pronounce it or explain it or know what it is. And, and so I, like the short and skinny of it, I like to tell people like, I'm like a life coach for your pregnancy and post and postpartum care and pregnancy or um, and, and parenthood. And so, uh, you know, I just, that's how this love your journey doula services became about. And it's important to me to be able to give impact in a way um, that makes people feel better. And this doula work, you know, it's, I am the tool, but, but really my job is to give you whatever you feel like you're lacking and let you recognize that you really already have it. I'm just really solidly holding the mirror in front of you so that you can see yourself and know that like you already have what it takes to be a good parent and to do this journey and 
to birth this baby and that you're going to be okay. Like I'll, I'll give you the tools. I'll give you the, the research, the evidence-based research. We'll have the hard conversations. I will show you how to swaddle that baby. I will show you how to do the, you know, labor techniques, but you really have what you need. It's just pumping you up and being your biggest cheerleader. And so that to me, um, is the most rewarding thing about the work that I do. Like it is giving people those warm and fuzzies and seeing them at the end of that journey, um, the reward that they have in their faces when they see their baby or the shock that they have when they're like, Oh my gosh, I did this and I did it without medication. And everybody told me I couldn't, or, you know, I survived the C-section and I thought it was going to be the worst thing for me or to me and realizing um, that they overcame that to me is worth any more than any amount of money anyone could ever give me. And I will continue to do that work solely for the heart stake that it gives me. I mean, that is beyond beautiful. The transformation that you talk about being able to help women through I've, I've witnessed it, not on the birthing side of it, but your spirit transcends beyond just the element of being able to educate the mama that's going through it. I think it's the mamas that are experiencing it as well. And that's where you really have cultivated even another level of your service model that supports other moms and you like the thought process that has gone into your pamper boxes and what mm. you're you're trying to be able to to go through because we talked about all of this hard crap that we deal with as mothers mm -hmm. and we each have our own journey how do we then take this lovely blocks of love that you have created and channel some time for ourselves because so often, and you know, there's trending topics on what does self-care look like? Um, right. It's a bubble bath <laughs> or it's a jog or it's whatever, but it's really defining what it means for ourselves. How did yeah, you absolutely. take from that birthing experience and your experiences with moms to create this beautiful box that um, helps moms remember themselves? You know, it, like most things in business, it came organically, right? Like I'm helping these families and mamas and I'm, I'm watching my, my news feed and, and COVID time. And I'm watching people struggle. And me myself was also struggling transitioning from being at home with everyone all the time. And, you know, uh, as most mothers know, like you're a mom, you don't clock out ever. And so when everyone's here, the clock never really stops. And we're just not meant to do that um, for months and months and months at a time. So watching that and seeing that, I saw that there was a need, like women are literally struggling while caring for these babies and husbands and businesses and not taking care of their self at all. Like it should be care for myself, you know, like the oxygen mask, you know, um, scenario. And I was watching women put themselves on the last of the list. And because they were the last on the list, they weren't even getting to themselves on the list. Like it became, they were last on the list and then they were not on the list anymore. And so I thought, how can I, help um women not to do that like how can i love them um while also respecting social distancing right, right. So, <laughs> love your journey uh pamper box was created and um because i just want to make sure i'm making the most impact that i can and because um black women creators and just, um, people of color are so important to me. Um, I thought, how can I, how can I mesh all of those things together and how can I close the gap that is already in one women of business, but women of color in business. And so, uh, that's kind of how the self-care pamper box was created. Um, and so every quarter, we take, we, we pick one um, women of color creator and we feature them in our box. And so the box is handcrafted 
um, self-care stuff full of love in a box that gets shipped directly to your house and you can use it at your leisure whenever you have time. And it's just a way for women to really love on themselves and really acknowledge that they need, um, they need that time out. You need that time out to decompress, to take care of yourself, to love on yourself. However, that may look for you and in whatever time that may look for you. It's just a tool that uh, my business has created to give to women who might need it. So yeah, that's how it got started. I think that the the bridging of the whole aspect of putting your worlds together into one space that allows women to be able to see you, but also see themselves is just beautiful. Um, and we, we never think that a product that we produce is necessarily going to do that, but you've brought that to life. And I, I, I know that the love and passion that goes behind every single piece that you put in that box is very thought out. What is that oh, I, going to uh, I live, breathe, and sleep. But like, yes, I have my dual work and have my clients, but I literally sleep with a, a, a notepad next to my bed when I'm like, oh, let's create this. You know, like we're working on something for the next box. And, and I said, I want to make my own uh, adult coloring book that's strictly just about self-care. And so, you know, of course, a lot of people are like, you can't create one by yourself. And I was like, hmm bet <laughs> watch me now it's currently being um binded right now in a book so it's gonna be in another week so that was yeah. so fast <laughs> yeah it was really fast yeah but that really was fueled by someone who uh, by many no's and um as I say uh how do I turn that no into a yes <laughs> And if we can just lead that life um, from a no to a yes, I think we will all be better in creating um, spaces for ourselves, creating spaces for our families and creating spaces for our communities to take care of ourselves, love on each other uh, and create change that's, that's needed. So Kimmy, where can everybody hang out with you? You have this great spirit about you. You are welcoming and wonderful and really do care about everybody that walks into your life. I can say that as somebody who has and have have felt that um, unconditional type of love that you give to others. So where can people hang out with you and, and spend time with you? You can find me on my social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Kimmy Wilson Co. K-I-M-I-W-I-L-S-O-N-C-O. And in our link, you can find my website and all of our um, items that we have there. Well, and we will make sure to link to the box, link to your social media. So Thank you. Um, people can support you as well as support uh, the other small businesses, business women that you are featuring in every one of your boxes. And most certainly take time out for ourselves because every woman deserves that. Whether you're a mom or not, maybe you're a grandma, right. maybe you're an auntie, maybe you're a caregiver. Uh, all of us deserve a little pause in life to be able to care. And maybe you're someone who just wants to support a mama or a woman, which is, we, we take that too. Yeah. <laughs> we need all the support we can get. Yes. That's such a great idea. And as we are talking about it um, and our episode airs, it's going to be Mother's Day. It's a great opportunity for you oh. to celebrate a mother. Uh, by purchasing one of Kimmy's boxes and allowing them some time for true self-care, not in just the element of a hashtag that's trending on social media, but really taking that into their lives. So Kimmy, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I feel like we could talk all day long. Is there any last <laughs> words of what, and sometimes we do. Uh, <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> any last words? I just want to say thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Any last words of wisdom that you would like to share with us? Um, you know, as I tell all of my clients, um, really the, the, the message in this life is really to just love the journey that you're on. And so that's what I would say to everyone who's listening. Um, no one, no, the person next to you or the person to the left of you, like, don't look at them. Uh, it's your journey. It's your life and love it the way that 
the one that you are on, the path that you are on is for you and love every single bit of it. Thank you so much for having me on. It was such an amazing time. I'm so grateful to just be able to be here and to talk with you. And so thank you so much. You're such an amazing force yourself. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much.